I'm sorry. What did I tell you? I what did I tell you? What did I tell you? You don't buy anything, you hear me? Don't buy anything. Today is Tuesday, September 28th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. A brutal day for the Bulls, of course, but it was Christmas for the Bears. And for the Mavericks, it's Christmas every day. We play the market up and we play it down. And no need for Santa because we're real. But anyhow, what happened in the market today? The much-anticipated pop in the U.S. dollar took place, but we have the dreadful condition of the U.S. dollar and yields popping higher together. And in this scenario, the algorithmic guideline says it's bad for everything, with exception of certain commodities. This scenario is bad for energy, oil, gold, the inflation trade, the tech trade, everything is down, with perhaps few pockets in the commodities market and financials. But even financials did not hold. We saw a pop in the morning in financials, energy, but that was reversed quickly. Why? Because of the ETFization of the market. It makes the sell-off in the big cap technology names contagious to the entire market. And therefore, if these names continue to sell off aggressively, then the entire market will suffer. And that leads me to In Focus tonight. We will talk about the last chapter of this bubble. Because it's becoming evident now that we are nearing the end. And to illustrate that, we have to revisit the wall of worry. But we have to add a new item here. And the new item is the head of the Federal Reserve himself, Jerome Powell, Wall Street's best friend. The best thing that ever happened to the stock market. And this thing, Jerome Powell, is about to be taken away from the market. I do believe that the market attempted to bounce today, but the bounce failed. And the reason is this exchange between Senator Warren and Chairman Jerome Powell. And it is absolutely stunning what Elizabeth Warren said to Jerome Powell. I came to Washington after the 2008 crash to make sure that nothing like that would ever happen again. Your record gives me grave concern. Over and over, you have acted to make our banking system less safe, and that makes you a dangerous man to head up the Fed, and it's why I will oppose your renomination. And of course, it's one thing for a douchebag YouTuber to describe the chairman of the Fed as a criminal, but it is entirely different and more important, of course. We have a sitting U.S. senator describing a sitting Fed chairman as a dangerous man, and he is indeed a dangerous man, a danger to this economy and to the society because his reckless policies is creating the biggest bubble in human history. And it has created so far the largest wealth inequality gap in history in this country. It has ushered a destructive inflation, the likes that we have never seen since the 1970s. So Jerome Powell is indeed a dangerous man. And now we have a setting U.S. Senator describing Powell as exactly that. This is one thing that the market cannot handle, the unknown. We know that whoever follows Powell, whether it is brain dead or boy stick or whoever, they're going to play ball with Wall Street and their main objective will be to prop up, preserve, protect and inflate the assets of the wealthy, equities and real estate, because this is the real mandate of the Fed. The bullshit mandate for the public, the full employment and price stability, that's just for show, to fool us, the village idiots that we are. But for now, the market will see the hostility against Jerome Powell as a reason for uncertainty. And when there is uncertainty, the market suffers. And it's not just uncertainty, by the way. We have all items on the wall of worry playing together. That leads us to tapering and reducing the so-called accommodative policy for Wall Street that has been going on since 2009, the so-called emergency accommodation. Wall Street has been under emergency accommodation from the Fed 
billions and billions and billions of dollars racked up in public debt to so-called accommodate Wall Street throughout the years due to the emergency of 2009 that apparently never ended. But now inflation is forcing the end of the accommodation policy. And when it comes to inflation, inflation is raging, raging out of control across the globe. And here is an exchange regarding the subject of inflation from the hearing that we got today from j Powell in Washington, D.C. And this, of course, comes from uh, Senator Toomey, who puts his glasses down like this, and he looks around, and he pretends to work for you. Mr. Powell, earlier this year, there were certainly sectors of our economy, especially the price-sensitive, um, the, the sectors sensitive to reopening, experienced pretty dramatic but largely temporary price spikes. It seems to me now we're seeing a broader, more troubling kind of inflation. Input prices are soaring across the board, raw materials, electrical components, energy, and consumer expectations <clears throat> seem to have internalized this. The New York Fed's most recent survey shows that they expect 5.2% inflation over the coming year. Despite this and all the growth that we've talked about, as you point out, the Fed is still buying $120 billion in securities every month. And I guess my question is, doesn't the inflation we're seeing now seem broader and more structural in nature than the brief blip we saw, say, in used car prices earlier this year? Yeah, yes, I think it's fair to say that it is. The, um, uh, mainly what we've seen is that the the supply side restrictions that that are so much at the heart of the inflation we're seeing have not only not gotten better they've actually in some cases gotten worse look at the car companies look at the look at the ships uh, dock or you know with their anchors down outside of Los Angeles and this is really uh, a mismatch between demand and supply and we need those supply blockages to alleviate to abate uh, before inflation can come down we we do believe that it will but um most, however, if you look at measured inflation and what's contributing to it, most of it is still from a very small uh, category of of. Uh, of uh, that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want you you could do so you you do you could you you want you want. So we now went from transitory to holy shit we. F we unleashed a monster. And the worst news is we have no control over this monster. The only tool that Jerome has is destroying the stock market bubble. To save this economy from inflation, Jerome Powell must sacrifice the bull market. And this is what I said months ago. Kill the bull. This is the only way to save the economy. You sacrifice the stock market. You sacrifice the gains for Wall Street to keep the economy healthy. But of course, the Fed is not interested in the economy and regular folks. The Fed is interested in the stock market and Wall Street and the stock market since 2009, but in particular, after 2013, 2014, the market has been a cocaine addict. What does that mean? It means that the market cares not about fundamentals, the economy, nuclear wars, alien invasions, asteroids hitting the planet, the extinction of humanity. That doesn't matter. What the market cares about, and the only thing that it cares about, is the co- cane coming out of the Federal Reserve, printing money out of thin air, racking up billions, if not trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in public debt to so-called accommodate Wall Street. A Wall Street takes the money, says, thank you so much. We're going to use the money for executive bonuses. I'm buying back our shares to prop up and manipulate our stock prices higher. And of course, when the crisis, the next one hit, the pandemic, and the market crashed, all of these trillions of dollars that was spent in share buybacks went down the toilet. A Wall Street extended their hands again, asking for bailouts from who? The taxpayer. Lather. Rins. Repeat. And while we're at it, let's listen to this exchange between Senator Brown, the imbecile that he is, and Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. Oh. Oh, the most recent jobs report saw, as you point out, saw unemployment decreasing generally, but it also showed a continued racial unemployment gap, and the unemployment is rising for black, member, black workers. 
You committed an airing on the side of lower unemployment and a more competitive labor market. Thank you for that. But last week, you announced that policy tightening will begin in November with tapering, that interest rate targets will increase next year. Why take away economic support just when workers are getting back on their feet and starting to see glimmers of real wage growth and when the recovery has failed to reach so many black workers? Um. We're, we're, right now, we're buying $120 billion worth of securities every month, and all of those purchases add to accommodation. They, they're increasing accommodation. Uh, and we had set a test uh, for beginning to taper those purchases of substantial further progress towards our statutory goals. Uh, we haven't met that yet, but as I mentioned, I think we've all but met it, met it on the path that we're looking at. We would continue to add accommodation, not subtract it for until well into the middle of next year. And we think that's appropriate given the, given the strength of the economy. Um, the test for raising interest rates is substantially higher. So Senator Brown says, Mr. Powell, you got to keep the so-called accommodative policy for Wall Street because this is how we're going to solve racial equity. We're going to create more jobs and that will lead to the thrive of marginalized groups in our society. When we now know, we have enough evidence, of course, that the only direct result of this reckless monetary policy, the cocaine operation, greasing up Wall Street with fake cash printed out of thin air to so-called accommodate accommodate them because apparently Wall Street is under an emergency since 2009. But this moron haven't learned anything at all. The only direct result of this so-called accommodative policy is propping up bubbles, hyper bubbles in the equities and real estate market, and now creating and propping up inflation higher. But there is no direct correlation at all between printing money out of thin air and handing it out to Wall Street and the creation of jobs. The creation of jobs in the economy happens from an organic approach, a bottom-up approach, not a top-bottom approach. Matter of fact, after more than a year since the pandemic emergency accommodation were released, on top of the emergency accommodation that have been going on since 2000. Nine. What have we achieved so far? We still have over 8 million people unemployed. Meanwhile, we have the largest stock market bubble in history. We have the largest real estate bubble in history. We have the largest inflation crisis since the 1970s. But Senator Brown says, a little more coke, or we're going to help black people. And of course, Senator Brown could care less about black people, because here is the reality. The median household income was $67,500 in 2020, down 2.9% from the prior year as the United States dealt with the economic fallout in the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, the billionaires, soon to be trillionaires, made over $10 trillion in added wealth. So once again, is the Fed's policies designed to help the little guy or the big guy? On top of that, here's a story from the Wall Street Journal regarding inflation. When we talk about tapering and this moron calling for Jay Powell to continue the accommodative policy for Wall Street because someday it might help black people. The story from the journal says, what is your raise really worth? Inflation has something to say about it. For the lowest paid Americans, real wages adjusted for rising prices fell 0.5% in August from a year earlier. What does that mean? Real wages are actually down. Why? Because on paper, your wages might have gone higher, but inflation is also surging higher at a faster pace and a higher pace. And therefore, whatever gains you have in your wages, you're now paying more. Your wage increases just got canceled. And here's the story for Mr. Sutton, who's a black gender, and his pay went from 12 bucks an hour to 18 bucks an hour. So Senator Brown says, I care about this guy and I want the Fed to accommodate Wall Street a little more and this little guy will somehow benefit from all of that but forgo the fantasy because this is the reality. Speaking about Mr. Sutton, he and his wife started shopping more at supermarket chain Aldi this year. For many groceries are cheaper, he said, but the longer drive and higher gas prices have eaten up some of his savings. He has also cut up, cut out brand name cereals, rice, oatmeal, ketchup, and mustard. I'm making more money. I should be able to see it, Mr. Sun said, but I don't see it because I'm paying more money for stuff now. Do you hear that, Senator Brown? And today in the morning, we got the core case chiller index for the housing market, and we have broken 
record highs. Home prices are up 20% year over year. The biggest bubble in history. Tell me again how unaffordable housing prices and rent prices help the poor and the middle class. Housing prices are raging out of control and the bubble we're in right now is much, much larger than the housing bubble from 2005-2007 last time around. And here are the cities most impacted by the housing bubble. Among them, my beloved city of San Diego, the second largest increase year over year in housing prices second to Phoenix, Arizona. The Fed says our inflation target is 2%. Look at these numbers. Every single city in America, every single one, has double digits inflation when it comes to housing. Every single one of them. But the Fed says, rest assured, inflation will be transitory. Again, a dangerous man that you cannot trust at all. A dangerous man, a mad scientist who is experimenting with the economic and financial future of this country and the next generation of Americans. And all of this inflation raging out of control, hyperinflation, is causing U.S. consumer confidence to slump to seven-month low on Delta and, most importantly, inflation worries. Matter of fact, consumers are delaying purchases for big-ticket items. On one hand, there are shortages all over the place. On the other hand, prices are out of whack due to the reckless policy of the Federal Reserve stoking inflation higher. And you might have heard that the inflation crisis is becoming a global phenomenon now and we have a massive massive energy crisis over the united kingdom we have lines that go as far as miles and miles and miles waiting to fill their cars the vehicles with gas and now the uk is asking the army tanker drivers to step in to drive all of these trucks to deliver gas to stations and you are also aware about the log jam of cargo ships here in LA, California. And we are reaching right now about a hundred ships waiting in the dock, causing massive shortages of all kind of consumer goods, pushing prices higher and pretty much canceling the holiday season. Jerome Powell is the man who canceled Christmas because all of these Christmas goods will take longer and longer and longer to hit shelves and the prices will go higher and higher and higher. The stagflation phenomenon of prices rising out of whack, meanwhile causing the economy to slow down, is also becoming a global phenomenon. We identified the threat of stagflation in this channel months ago, and we warned and we warned and we warned that if the reckless policy of the Fed continues, the economy will head into a massive stagflation crisis, and we were made fun of. There were alarmists, there were conspiracy theorists, stop it with the FUD, bro. And you now know that pretty much every single thing that I predict in this channel comes to fruition, including the prediction of stagflation in the economy. What about other items in the wall of worry? We have China. What's going on with China right now? For now, we're not getting more news in the morning about more crackdowns, more regulations, but we're getting dire economic news from China. It is now becoming evident that the Chinese economy is slowing down significantly while prices continue to linger higher. And therefore, the energy crisis is becoming contagious not just in the United Kingdom, but we now have an energy crisis in China. Does this sound like the 1970s or what? But I know the 1970s will never happen again. The inflation that was back then, it's different now. Stop it with the FUD, bro. Okay, we'll see. We'll see how different this time around is. Here's another item in the wall of worry that is becoming front and center right now. The imminent debt crisis, the biggest debt crisis in U.S. history, and it could wipe out the entire global economy. The entire country could fall apart if the debt crisis hit, and we now have a deadline. The Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, a.k.a. the Godmother, is now warning that the government will run out of money by October 18th, and this added another shoe, another shoe that dropped on the market's head today. We now have a date, and we're running out of time. By October 18th, the entire government will fall apart, the entire economy will fall apart, and the market will suffer a crash like you have never seen before. A crash that will rival the Great Crash of 1929 that led to the Great Depression. Your beloved politicians right now playing games, both the blue cult and the red cult. They're playing with fire. They're playing politics because they don't have your interest in mind. The poor, the middle class, average folks. They're busy gambling on stocks, gambling on options, using insider information. The highest level of corruption in U.S. government that we have ever seen. And we now have a dire warning 
from bankster Jamie Dimon, who is already preparing JP Morgan for the catastrophe that's about to happen when the US defaults on its debt, absent of a deal before. October 18th. What else? In the wall of worry, we have the debacles from the Biden administration, the threat of taxation. This is still here, and you can always bet on more debacles from the Biden administration. He's already souring the relationship of the United States with France and other major European allies. What about the virus? It's still here. It's peaking. When it comes to the virus, good news is bad news for the market. And bad news is good news for the market. Why? Because if Delta is raging and people are dying and we have lockdowns, that justifies more so-called accommodation, aka more coke, from the Fed into the market. But if Delta is peaking and cases are not rising anymore, and we have more progress when it comes to the vaccinations, this is all good news, which means bad news for the market. Because it doesn't justify the need for more coke to accommodate Wall Street in the stock market. What about the threat of margin calls and the black swan? It's still here, and perhaps we're getting closer and closer and closer to the domino effect crash that will trigger margin calls across the board. And this will evolve a correction in the market that meant to be 10% correction, 15% correction into a 25 plus percent correction. It could be as large as 50%. Matter of fact, we have market bears here calling for a 66% crash in the stock market. It has always ended in tears. A notorious market bear who called the dot-com bubble says investors have too much faith. The Fed support will continue to prop up the most extreme valuations in history and warns stocks could be due for a 66% drop. You can heed this warning, or you can continue to indulge in la, -la land where rationale doesn't exist at all. For example, we have Tesla witch Kathy Wood. Mama Kathy said, we couldn't be further from a market bubble. You can believe that. There is no market bubble. Of course, the glorified day trader, Kathy Wood. You can also trust the face ripper, Tom Lee. Tom Lee says, get ready for the everything rally, and it is time to buy the dip. And the last thing I want to discuss here is a follow-up on yesterday's video. We talked about the corruption, the criminal behavior of insider trading from Fed presidents Kaplan and Rosengren. And who knows who else, by the way. In today's hearing, Mr. Powell was asked about the behavior of Kaplan and Rosengren and the suspicious coincidental resignations that we got yesterday. And here is Powell's response. Our need to sustain the public's trust is the essence of our work. We, we want them to under, public to understand that we're working for all Americans. Uh, and um, so we don't like to be having these concerns raised. It's really something that's, that's very, very concerning. So as soon as I learned of it, I, I, I directed our staff to undertake a review of our practices. We've had in place a set of practices around investments and trading and disclosure that seems to have worked for a long time, only it's, it's clearly, uh, it's really not working now. And we, we understand now that we need to raise modify our practices and we're, we're in the in the process of creating ideas and, and uh, recommendations for that that's one thing that we're doing we're also looking carefully at, at the trading uh, that, that that was done to make sure that it's uh, that it's uh, in compliance with our rules and and uh, and with the law of course this is garbage this is all bullshit he's not going to do anything at all can you imagine if i start a hedge fund for example or any organization and I create a set of rules. Here are the ethics rules, which is, by the way, so loose that it violates the law, the actual law. Can you imagine if I get caught inside of trading and I go in front of a judge and I say, you know what, Your Honor, I'm not guilty because I did not violate any rules. The rules that I made up for myself. I did not violate any of that. Come on, Your Honor. Come on, man. You think that would fly in court? Well, maybe it will. You know why? Because we now know that even judges, yep, judges, are now yoloing stocks. More than 130 federal judges have violated U.S. law and judicial ethics by overseeing court cases involving companies in which they or their family own stock. Ta da! A Wall Street Journal of investigation found judges failed to recuse themselves from 685 such cases since 2010. Folks, this is the swamp, this is the jungle, the unregulated jungle. Predators all over the place, criminals, white collar criminals, public servant criminals running loose all over the place. When do we wake up? When do we say, 
enough is enough. It is time to restore law and order. Law and order. The real one, not the orange clowns one. Law and order. If you are interested in holding public offices, whether it is Congress, Senate, Federal Reserve, Federal judges, you have to do it with the sole interest of serving the public. No stock trading at all. Zero. Nothing. But do you think this will happen in this unregulated jungle? Of course not. Criminals running loose. Take, for example, Wells Fargo, who got caught defrauding their own customers, by the way. What is the punishment? Wells Fargo pays $37 million to resolve Justice Department claims it defrauded currency customers. A little slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. Wink, wink, do it again. I will charge you another fine lather. Rens repeat, no law, no order, no oversight, no regulations, nothing at all. Meanwhile, we have regular people, by the way, who are still in jail because they got caught holding a bag of weed. But these white-collar criminals, they get away with murder for the right price. And what about this piece of shit? Remember that one? He's running loose to a criminal who preyed on retail investors, by the way, and continues to prey on retail investors and traders by using order flows and other nasty tactics. This guy has been running loose. And who's going to stop him, by the way? Gary Ginsler? Gary Ginsler is in a coma. The man cannot stop sleeping. He wakes up in the morning, put a suit on for show, barks for a minute or two, and then he goes back to sleep. And the last thing I want to mention here before I move on to the market's coverage, you might hear in the media these days because yields are popping higher. And we should embrace that because yields rise higher as an indicator for economic growth and the prospects of the economy. So we should not fear rates rising higher. These people are absolutely delusional. Here's a chart of the 10-year yield. If higher yields meant better economy, then boy, the economy has been getting worse and worse and worse throughout the years. We had the best economy back in the early 80s when we had a recession. This is all baloney, of course. Yields are rising higher in anticipation that the Fed will be forced to tighten because inflation is raging out of control. And inflation will force the Fed to taper and raise interest rates faster than many market experts are predicting. What happens when interest rates rise higher? Well, in this hyper-bubble, hyper-mania market with extreme valuations, these extreme valuations throughout the years, specifically in the tech, momentum, and growth stocks in the market, were based on lower yields. Low interest rates support future earnings. Meanwhile, low interest rates punish current earnings. Which companies were rising higher due to future prospects? The future bro. Tech, momentum, growth, companies with no profit, sometimes no revenue. We have retail traders, investors, and institutions alike who bought these names, these stocks, merely on the argument of the future bro. In the future, this will be the next big deal. Lower interest rates are supportive for this kind of investing. On the other hand, higher interest rates punish future earnings while rewarding current earnings. What does that mean? It means that the future bro goes out of the window and the companies that produce earnings now, cash flow now, the old school boring companies, the value stocks, outperform tech growth and momentum because as interest rates rise higher, we appreciate current earnings, not future earnings. It's a simple mathematical formula, folks. Look it up. So when these experts say we don't have to worry about interest rates rising higher, matter of fact, we should celebrate interest rates rising higher. What a bunch of fools. You think higher interest rates will support the market? We have the most overvalued market in history, all on the prospects of the future, bro. This transition from abandoning an investment strategy that has been working for over a decade now to an old school investment strategy of value stocks, companies with present cash flow. This transition will be extremely violent. And the reason is, number one, these stocks, which form the majority of the market right now, the majority of the valuation in the market right now, will have to get a haircut a massive one, and this will slaughter the market as a whole. Number two, we have a new generation of investors who did not see a bear market before, who did not see a regular market before. They only started investing after 2009, and therefore they're accustomed 
to buying the dip in technology, growth, momentum, and therefore they will continue to catch a falling knife over and over and over again. And when you slaughter a huge chunk of market participants because they're having a hard time believing and adapting with the change, these two factors alone will accelerate any market correction and evolve it into a market crash that transition from a lower interest rates regime to a higher interest rate regime in the market will come with a massive amount of collateral damage. Anyhow, folks, we're moving on to the market's coverage today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average is down 569.84 points or a decline of 1.63%. The Nasdaq down 423.29 points or a decline of 2.83%. The S&P 500 down 90 and a half points or a decline of 2.04%. What about the sector's performance today? Pathetic across the board. We're not going to give any medals today. Pretty much every single sector of the market closing in the red, led by technology, communication services, and healthcare. When yields pop higher aggressively, as we talked about before, this is not good for the tech high growth, high momentum names. What about the advance to decline ratios? The NYSE, 27% advancing versus 71% declining. The NASDAQ, 20% advancing versus 78% declining. Now, what do we say every time we have exaggerated ratios, up or down? When you have only 27% advancing, 20% advancing on the NASDAQ, this is usually, usually not always, a tradable bottom. Pay attention now tradable bottom not an actual bottom so my expectations are that the market will rebound in a reflex rebound higher and we'll see what happens next moving on to futures what's going on here pain across the board there is a point when the rise in the u.s dollar has to hit oil prices and that inflection point happened today crude oil prices down big not big but one percent apiece for the WTI and Brent, we say not big because these declines are coming on the heels of massive gains for crude oil futures. Likewise, the relentless rally in natural gas futures continues, albeit closing at the lows of the day, meaning perhaps we're about to see a bottom here, a bottom for now. So long as the Fed continues to print money out of thin air, stoking inflation higher these prices will continue to go higher and higher and higher and we have calls that oil prices will reach 100 by the end of the year and i believe that this could happen easily what about softs we have gains for coffee cotton sugar and cocoa cotton futures caught a bid as of late and of course traders were eyeing the level of 100 so perhaps we have a top here if traders were eyeing 100 reach the target already and now profit taking pursues we also have losses for lumber and oj futures today what about metals pain across the board gold down silver down platinum down copper down palladium down big everything is down yields are rising the us dollar is rising higher no brainer here you're gonna have pain in metals what about meats live cattle futures on the flat line and we have gains modest ones for feeder cattle futures meanwhile the new big tech Lean hogs bucking the trend and rising higher once again. Moving on to grains, pain across the board, soybeans down, soybean meal down, soybean oil down, corn down, wheat down, rice down, oats down, everything is down, with the exception of canola, rising slightly higher. And the million dollars question is, where is the top, at least for now, in the US dollar? Look at currencies, for example. The dollar is popping higher on the heels of the massive drop in sterling. My call is we might see a day or two here of the sterling down and the dollar popping higher. But I do believe that we're getting closer to our bottom here in the sterling. And if the sterling pops higher, the dollar will ease. What do we have in the UK right now? The energy crisis. But they're calling the army. They're working on resolving the issue. And therefore, the fears of dumping the sterling today, those fears will ease at least for now. And when that happens, we will have a tradable top in the US dollar. And before we move on, we don't cover this every day, but we have P prices exploding higher. So the Fed stoking inflation higher. Meats prices are surging higher. Okay, so we're going to forego eating meat. Too expensive. I'm going to go vegan and eat Beyond Meat Burger. Well, guess what? Beyond Meat Burger is going to cost you an arm and a leg now because P prices are exploding higher. So we're going to go from let them eat cake to wait a minute, even cake is expensive. Let them eat dirt. Let them eat dust. Let them eat 
oxygen. Isn't that good enough for you guys? Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here at number one? Back again. Apple, with about 1 million contracts, about 60% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, with about 670,000 contracts, 60% of those were calls. Tesla remains suspicious here. It continues to outperform the market. It was down slightly today, but still outperforming big cap technology stocks and other growth momentum names. Somebody very powerful, a large whale, is buying a significant amount of call options in Tesla. They have a goal here. They have a price they want to reach millions, if not billions of dollars on stake for Tesla prices to continue to stay higher for that somebody, the quote unquote entity. And they will continue to pump Tesla higher and higher and higher until they achieve their objectives. Therefore, I'm not standing on the way of this train. Let them achieve the objective and then we will have a top. I think about it, by the way, whose paycheck, whose options package depends on Tesla share price to stay elevated. I'll just leave it at that. I think you know the answer. But here it is at number three, AMD with about 500,000 contracts, about 67% of those were calls. Moving on to unusual trades, starting with the ticker KRE for regional banks. As yields pop higher, so will the KRE for regional banks. They're highly sensitive to the rise in the 10-year treasury yield rise or fall by the way and therefore we have somebody buying puts here a contrarian bet because they're betting that interest rates will drop down again and what we're seeing in the 10-year treasury yield is a transitory action a transitory pop and therefore they bought the 59 puts the expiration date November 19th, with expectations that the KRE will drop by more than 13% by then. They paid about 90 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $2 million. What about the trade for the ticker XOP? This is for the oil ETF. Again, massive bets here that oil prices will surge higher, will explode higher. Everybody now is eyeing the 100 bucks a barrel for crude oil. And I believe they will get what they want. They will get the wish. And therefore, they're buying calls on the XOP, the 115 calls, with the expiration date of November 19th, with expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 18% by then. They paid about a buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $4 million. What about the trade for the ticker XLE? This is another energy ETF, perhaps a larger ETF than XOP, but again, it has more exposure to the low beta names. So if you're looking for an extra spicy move, you go with the XOP. If you're looking for more mature, calculated moves, low risk, you probably want to go with the XLE and therefore they're buying the 56 calls with the expiration date November 19th. With expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 6% by then, they paid about one buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.3 million. What about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They're buying puts here, betting for more declines to come, specifically the 411 puts with the expiration date of October 18th, with expectations that the name will drop down by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 60 cents a piece to enter the trade. All in all, spending about two and a half million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker ARKKKKKKK for Tesla Witch Kathy Wood? They're betting for massive declines here by buying the 102 puts for the expiration date of October 15th, with the expectations that the name will drop down by more than nine and a half percent by then. They paid about one buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker TDOC, Teladoc? which is, by the way, a component of the RKK. But they're betting for upside here by buying the 145 calls for the expiration date November 19th, with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 11% by then, and they paid about 4 bucks and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $3 million. And at the bottom of the table, Baba for Alibaba. They're betting for an upside here. Perhaps we already have a bottom. I disagree. I already traded the Alibaba calls and I'm done with them based on the implied volatility. But somebody is betting for more gains to come here by buying the 165 calls with the expiration date of October 8th. With the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 8% by then, they paid about one buck and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about 675 
$1,000. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker QQQ, the NASDAQ? They're betting for more pain to come, not gain, pain. By buying the 325 puts with the expiration date, October 27th. With the expectations that the name will drop down by more than 10% by then, they paid about 2 bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker TSLA? You guessed it, the souffle. They continue to bet down here. I don't understand why. Perhaps they know something that I don't know. But you're fighting this whale, whoever that is. And they're buying the 735 puts with the expiration date October 15th. With the expectations that the name will drop down by more than 6% by then. They paid about 18 bucks a piece. 18 not cents, bucks a piece. All in all, spending about $9 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what we have here, a bloodbath across the board. Not even financials were able to stand. The only, the last man standing here is energy, barely. And then we have Alibaba popping higher. We talked about this name, the top and implied volatility. This is how the mechanics of the market work. And most likely this will be a transitory bottom in Alibaba. But when we think about buying the dip, the rationale goes the names that drop the most will bounce the most. Now, the problem with this kind of thinking is, yes, you might have a massive pop tomorrow, not erasing all the losses, of course. But when you trade options, perhaps you make some money if you bought calls at the end of the day today for names like Facebook, Microsoft, Nvidia, etc. The names that drop the most. But the rational investor, the rational trader, looks at the names that managed to outperform today and they start long positions in these names if they're interested in buying the dip. Now, I do believe that we're not through the pain yet. We don't have a bottom in the market, but I would choose the strong, not the weak. What is the strong? You look at JP Morgan, you look at Bank of America, you look at Oracle, you look at Cisco, Intel, you look at names in the energy sector of the market, you look at names in the drug manufacturers, which also fared better than the majority of the market. And of course, we have Ford, the outlier today, Ford outperforming the market entirely. And we have news from Ford, they're ramping up production for their electric vehicle line, and they're hiring over 11 thousand workers and i know the culties of tesla make fun of ford this is the dying dinosaur but watch out here because the dying dinosaur is the facade of the cult of elon who makes empty promises all the time tesla is the dying dinosaur and the reason is the stock of tesla is already inflated the opportunity is in the stock that is not inflated yet and that is ford so when it comes to stocks ford is the new cool guy tesla is the dinosaur and perhaps when it comes to actual vehicles ford will be the new cool kid and tesla will become the dinosaur don't underestimate what ford is doing right now they're heading all targets and they're showing tangible results not empty promises moving on to the charts analysis starting with tweets that i issued today Number one, I said that the dip buyers will continue to buy the dips, but this will be yet another bull trap. And the second tweet is, we have support here, the SPY at around 434, the Qs 360 and a half. My assumption is, and I chatted with a bunch of traders on Twitter, that I do believe these will hold for now, keyword for now. So let's take a look at the charts here, the SPY, 30 minutes chart, the 434 appears to be the bottom for now, the tradable bottom, not the bottom. The likelihood is, looking at the chart, traders want the chart to go down and retest 430 for a double bottom see how it holds the support 434 the resistance 438 we have gaps all over the place and perhaps the writing was on the wall when the spy failed to close the gap above and reversed before closing that gap now we have another gap higher and of course that becomes a target for traders to close but before we do that we have to discuss the weakness the massive weakness in the market today the natural conclusion is we have more pain to come but you gotta look at the technicals here from a 30 minutes perspective where is the rsi trading oversold territory not as oversold as the last bottom, the last dip that was bought, but close enough. The likelihood is we will see a mechanical rebound, at least overnight, 
and then we'll take it from there. The ideal scenario for the bears is a gap higher and then a crap, another failure to rally higher. The ideal scenario for the bulls is for the chart to gap down, opening at 430, 429, even 428, and then we see massive dip buying closing at the highs of the day. Then we have a tradable bottom. Not only that, but we have a double bottom formation to look forward to. Moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract and the SPY, a massive flush down. And again, it didn't look good to begin with. I warned from dip buying, but the dip buyers did not listen anyways. And now they're getting slaughtered. They're going to buy the dip again, but will this one work or not? Who knows? The likelihood is it will not. The chart rebounded all the way to the trend line. and We had a failure. And this behavior is an indicator that the market will have a hard time climbing back to all-time highs. And perhaps the top is already here. The momentum indicators are curling down again negative divergence the volume is rising higher on down days the support of 4384 and a half is broken and the likelihood is perhaps we're seeing a formation of a reverse a b c pattern we have the a leg the rebound the b leg and now we have the other leg the c leg which will flush down all the way to 4000 232 moving on to the nasdaq 30 minutes chart what's going on here once again a massive drop all the way to 360 and a half, which I believe will hold for now, at least overnight. And by the way, you better hope that this support will hold, because if it doesn't, the NASDAQ will be in a world of pain. The resistance is 363, where's the RSI trading oversold territory, opening the way, opening the door for a rebound higher tomorrow. Will it hold? The likelihood is it will not. Here's a chart of the continuous contract in the NASDAQ, a daily chart. The momentum indicators are getting crushed here. Negative divergences accelerating the move to the downside with higher volume. And now we have a confirmation that we have a head and shoulder formation. Why do I say that this level that the NASDAQ is trading at right now, closed at right now, better hold? Because the next support will be all the way down to 14,000, meaning the NASDAQ will drop top to bottom, a correction of about 11%. Again, this is normal in your father's market, not in this bubble market. So what is the big deal here if the NASDAQ goes down 10%? Because pretty much every single year in a regular market, we have 10% corrections. This is normal. The problem this time around, we have new participants in the market. They're not used to 10% corrections. On top of that, we have the highest levels of margin borrowing. And that means if we have a drop of about 10%, we have the possibility of margin calls. A margin calls could accelerate the drop from 10% to 15 to 20 and even more. Moving on to the IWM small caps, the Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart. Gapping down and breaking the support of 223, which is now resistance. If the pain continues in the Russell, we have to look down for 218. The candlestick pattern doesn't look good because we have a bear flag formation. But there is the possibility that the market as a whole bounces when a mechanical technical rebound due to oversold conditions in the SPY and the NASDAQ specifically. If that happens, we'll see how the IWM reacts at around 223. Absent of that, the assumption is the IWM will flush down all the way to 218. And here it is, the source of trouble, the Dixie, the US dollar, popping higher. And now we have a solid resistance line at around 93.7. But the momentum is so strong in the US dollar from an RSI and MACD perspectives. And therefore, that resistance could be broken easily. We will see the dollar trading at around 94 even 95. I do believe we have another pop coming and that pop will be the last one before the dollar cools down. What about gold? What's going on here? Not looking good. And if the dollar has another pop coming one more time before it cools off, then the likelihood is gold will flush down to 1,685. We have a double bottom, a quadruple bottom, by the way, and then we'll take it from there. Perhaps that level, 1,680, 685, will be a solid support for gold. But gold is not getting any help here because yields are popping higher. A massive surge here, historic one. And yields are eyeing a level. My belief is 1.6%. Maybe tops 1.7%. Of course, the ultimate destination is 2%, but that will come gradually. For now, for this shot higher, 1.6, 1.7 at the most, and then yields will cool off. The problem is a blast all the way to 1.7 
one shot in a day or two will cause a lot of pain in the NASDAQ, the growth, momentum names. Therefore, I say we haven't seen the end of the pain yet in the NASDAQ and the momentum names. And here's a chart for the TLT, a weekly chart. The momentum indicators are reversing down. We don't have a crossing. We don't have a confirmation yet for the loss in momentum. But we're getting closer here. If that happens, the TLT will go down to about 134, 134 and a half. If that happens, yields will pop higher to 1.6, 1.7. As bond prices go down, yields pop higher. But what about the VIX, the most accurate indicator for the market right now? Spot on, week after week, month after month. At some point, it's not going to work, but for now, it's working. And we have to be thankful for that. The four hours chart of the VIX, looking at the MACD indicator. Every time we have a crossing, creating green impressions on the histogram, we have a massive pop of double digits minimum on the VIX. Therefore, the moment you saw the pop, the crossing, we have green columns being drawn at the histogram. You knew right away we will see pain in the SPY and the VIX will pop higher. But looking at the MACD right now, is the move over yet? The answer is no, it's not. You combine the MACD with the RSI and the candlestick pattern, but we have another pop coming in the VIX. Now, it could cool down overnight or early in the morning in response to a mechanical bounce, a technical bounce in the indices, but that will fade away quickly. And therefore, the bears must be watching for gap and crap. Not on the VIX, of course, in the SPY and the stock market. And before I forget, by the way, two questions. Number one, why do you dislike trading the UVXY? This comes from experience. I've been trading the VIX for years and years and years. Every time I bought calls on the UVXY, I lost money with very few exceptions because there is an error in design for the ETF. However, I only use the UVXY these days to buy puts. When I have a crossing in the MACD from four hours perspective, in the VIX's chart, I buy puts in the UVXY and the puts work okay, not the calls. If you're betting on the VIX to pop higher, you could get lucky buying calls in the UVXY, but your luck will run out. Therefore, the preferred method of going long the VIX is buying puts on the SPY. Question number two is, this is for the bears by the way, they buy puts and they have a day like we got today. And they're buying weekly puts, by the way. They score big, but they get greedy and they don't book profits. What happens the day after? The market rebounds higher and those puts are now losing significant amount of value. Why do you have to put yourself in this kind of situation? If you're buying short-term puts with weekly expirations, book your profits quickly. Greed is not good when it comes to options. If you score big, book the gains, and you can always buy the same option at another time, perhaps at a better placement on the chart. Anyhow, I'm moving on here to Apple daily chart. What's going on here? We have the bear flag formation. It is playing out, and the likelihood is, with all the pain that we're seeing in FANG and the big cap technology names with the rise in yields, suppose yields go to 1.7%, and Apple will go down to the correction target of about 15% correction from the top, all the way down to the consolidation range of the channel that Apple has been trading in within going back more than a year ago. And here it is, Tesla, the souffle, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? Pump and dump right away, they pump on Monday, they dump later. But what I saw intraday tells me that the pop is not over yet. Somebody continues to buy the dips in Tesla via massive call options trades. They want the stock to go higher. For whatever reason, they either have a price target, 800, 900, 1000, whatever it is, or they have a time target, meaning the stock has to trade above 700, 600, whatever number it is, until October, until November, whatever date they have. They will continue to pump millions and millions of dollars, buying call options to create mini gamma squeeze to push the stock higher. Therefore, this is toxic waste for me, from a trading perspective, until the so-called pumper whale is revealed or resolved, meaning they achieve their objective, whatever that is, then Tesla becomes tradable. But right now, it's a battlefield between this whale, other shorts, other bears who continue to buy also millions of dollars worth of puts. I'm just here grabbing the popcorn and watching the show. What about tulips? BTC, what's going on here? Not looking good. We have a bear flag. The good news is they're testing over and over and over again the support of 42,000. The bad news is it's just a matter of time before the bear flag materializes and we see a drop, another leg down, perhaps all the way down to 35,750. And by the way, some traders brought up the point that when you look at weekly or even monthly charts of BTC, it's not looking good at all. 
This is a weekly, for example. And as you can see, the momentum indicator is already diving down to negative territory. And pretty much every chart, any mania chart, whether it is tulips or meme stocks or even going back to the dot-com bubble, has the same psychology and the same pattern. And we are now at a phase that is called return to normal, a bull trap which will be followed by a flush down and the end of the mania, the last chapter of the mania. And by the way, the same can be said to AMC's chart. It looks eerily similar to the chart of BTC. All of these mania charts, they look, react, and act the same way. And we are now at the last chapter of the mania. We have a bear flag. The likelihood is we will go to 32. 32 will not hold, and we will see a massive flush down from that point on. The apes have some time here, but they need a catalyst. They need something to excite a short squeeze or a gamma squeeze, or perhaps both to push the stock higher, but they're running out of time. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have more Fed zombies speaking, including Jerome Powell. We also have Harker from the Philly Fed. We have Daly from the San Francisco Fed. We have Boystick from the Atlanta Fed. And of course, they will make headlines if they sound hawkish. And on the macro front, we have one piece of data coming out tomorrow, which is the pending home sales. Again, not going to be relevant here. The entire market, housing and equity, is watching the action in the 10-year yield because... Another prop, 1.6, 1.7, will mean that the bond market is doing the tightening before Jerome Powell does. And this is telling the change in sentiment in the market. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.